Yo, yo. Hey, thank you for the sub, Tomboy. What's up, y'all? Mm, I wish I could freestyle. I would freestyle to this song. So much room for, for jams. Random, uh, random tune I just popped up on uh, Spotify. Let's see, what is it called? It is called Notes by Hazy Year. Anyways, it's been a it's been a hot minute since we've um, been able to hang out together. How's uh how's everyone doing? Did you guys have a decent weekend? What's your favorite altered voicing? I don't know, man. I'm not really sure. I think it kind of it's such a contextual thing. Depends on the the song and my mood and all that. But um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I don't think I have an answer for that. Martin, you've inspired me, and the second that things start to return to normal, I'm picking up a piano, uh, picking up piano lessons, and it's your fault. I will take full responsibility for that. <laughs> um, no, that's that's awesome, man. Thank you. I'm glad that um, I my work inspires you, and let me know how uh, how those lessons turn out. If you're serious about it. Um, you know, depending on how much willpower you have, um, I do hope that you you keep at it and uh, don't expect fast results. But who knows? Maybe you're talented enough to just hit the ground running. Anyways, we got locked down again for the next two months. Shazam, where are you based? Just got in Superior Music School in Modern Music. Oh. Is is the school that you got into called Superior Music School? I was looking forward to the stream all week, but I got so much homework to do. Ah, don't don't worry about it. You can always watch the the VOD after. Yo, we got a new subscriber. Yo, enter the goose. Thank you so much for the sub. All right, guys. So um, let me tell you about today's drill. So um, I had a little bit of a break from uh, from streams recently uh, because I really had to focus on getting this uh, this remix done for uh, for Charlie Puth. They had a, they had a pretty hard deadline, and I wanted to make sure I meet it. And um, turns out it's a lot easier for me to focus on um, like detailed work when I'm doing stuff off stream. <laughs> um, and I'm not entirely sure how what that means for my workflow um, related to streams in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll probably have to rethink my schedule just a little bit. But regardless, for today, my plan is to um, share you guys or share with you guys just the entire remix that I made for um, Charlie Puth. It's Puth, not Puth. Did I say Puth? Um, I don't know, but uh, he probably hates me by now because I've been pronouncing a puth for a hot minute. Anyways, um, so that was the... That's kind of like the main agenda for, for today was for me to show you guys that. <laughs> what is that little creature? It's cute. Um, so, Bretro, uh, thank you so much for the sub. Uh, so, let me load the project file here. Um, I haven't actually... I don't think anyone has heard, uh, aside from maybe some close, close friends and... Uh, 
my manager and stuff. I don't think anyone's had uh, anyone's heard the full remix, so um, I'll play it for you guys right now. And um, actually, why don't I um, why don't I play you guys the original first, and then and then I'll play you the uh, the remix that I made. I I've been having a lot of fun with some of these remix opportunities. Like, uh, it's just a it's for me it's 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 a very it's much more efficient time wise and the process it's much more straightforward than writing originals um because i kind of i kind of know um i, I usually know what i want to do with the remix fairly quickly but uh yeah so here's the original A Uniporium. Um, I don't know. I have I haven't really done one before, but um, but I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I definitely should do another one in the near future. Hey, Dark Death. God damn, that's crazy. <laughs> um, I wonder what the record is. That's a that's a long one. But yeah, so let me um. Forza. Thank you. Excited for the remix coming out. Wondering on the progress of the sample pack. You also need to do more collabs such as with Rogue Rabbit yeah. or Gali Matthias. That'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. Hopefully this happens soon. All those all those names are awesome. Uh, Grabbits and I um, actually have a track in progress um, and have had one in a while. Um, Gal Matthias is coming out with a new album, which is super exciting because he's been in hibernation for a while. But, uh, but yeah, thank you for the sub. So <clears throat> uh, I think... Some of you guys might know some of the remixes I've made before. Um, and uh, this is in a very... I, I remixed this track in a very similar style as uh, some of the other ones that I've done recently. Like the Martin Garrix Summer Days remix and uh, the uh, the Bazzy remix as well. But anyways, here's, uh, here's how it turned out. 
fun uh i had a lot of fun with it for sure the timeline was so short though that um i didn't have much time to do much detailed work hey thank you cozy thank you guys so much for the for the compliments though um yeah it's kind of it's kind of weird that i've been doing so many um remixes over the last year or so but um yeah, like I was mentioning before, it's been a lot easier to finish remixes than than originals, just because there's usually a there's very strict deadlines involved, and b um, there's so much content to work with already, and you don't really want to veer too far away from the original. You know, like I'm already uh, no, I don't I don't think I'm actually t that far off. Like I think this is um. I think this is more or less something that people could expect out of a remix, right? Because, I mean, for the most part, the vocal is there from the beginning to end. It's not like um, there's a massive, crazy amounts of rearranging. It's a it's a slightly different key. Um, it's a different vibe. But I think those are all standard for remixes, right? Like, it's nothing totally out of the ordinary there. But, um, but yeah, if you guys want, we can kind of, like, go through it a little bit together. And I can show you guys... Um, what's uh what's going on in the project file because it's actually quite straightforward um so there's um there's obviously the stems that i was given to remix the track um so it wasn't an opportunity that came about directly through um charlie and it wasn't something that my team was looking for specifically either it was like very coincidental that um i think it's a label that charlie used to or does work with um they reached out to somebody that I work with and 
that's how how the opportunity came about and so um so yeah um that's how it came together see you later bash thanks for hanging out for a sec um is there anything in particular you guys want to check out um because we can uh we can definitely dissect it a little bit there isn't actually like i said there isn't actually that much going on in this uh, in this project file but i'd be happy to to kind of go through it a little bit <laughs> why no lead solo if i had more time i think i would have done um i would have done more with it for sure but the deadline was 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 uh it, they needed a very fast turnaround so i did the best i could with the time limit and that that's also um that's also why uh it's basically vocals from beginning to end but that again, I think that kind of makes it a little bit more of a remix, anyways. Um, I think it might make it more likely for uh, Puth fans to to enjoy it. Uh, but I don't know. Who knows? Hard to say. Yeah, deadline was about a week, um, but it wasn't really the. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of like jumping back and forth and stuff. The turnaround before the reharm was cool. I'd like to see um, how you did that, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so l let me let me start from the beginning, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's there's it basically just starts with this uh, frequency shifted uh, sample uh, that um, then leads into a little bit of a fill. So that's like right here. So, um, obviously, yeah, just a little, um, just a kick drum here. Um, and then there's like this bass patch that I, that I made down below, um, which, uh, I saved, I saved the patch itself and muted it, um, and then rendered it to audio because uh, it made kind of editing it a little bit easier. Uh, so here are those plucks on their own. You can hear there's a, like quite a bit of saturation going on there and there's like some background elements as well um like these uh these pads and stuff and there's that um and where there's a little bit of crackling and stuff vinyl crackling this conversation yeah, I I found this little uh moment in the song where he did uh it's kind of like sigh grunt type thing. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I thought it sounded really cool and it was pitched down a little bit. <sighs> um so I threw that in right before the the downbeat. Um yeah, and so here here's where the vocals pop in obviously. Um after that little intro. Uh of this conversation we can come all this way to touch a little kiss a little all night long why, why would i be wearing pants um <laughs> i i haven't i've actually never been wearing pants on stream it's always a um really advanced uh there's this software I use that um, analyzes my skin tone and then just kind of uh, replaces it with with kind of like these gene presets, like pant presets. I can kind of select what um, what it should look like. I'm actually not even wearing a shirt right now either. Okay, so, um, so yeah, from here, it's still super straightforward. Uh, all that happens here is um, vocals get introduced and um, uh, the claps pop in there's some little background uh plucks happening here they're like panning left and right and stuff um so uh let's see 
what else is happening here? Um, there's some like subtle hi hat stuff happening. Still nothing very uh very uh obvious. Though. Like basically like the the I, for this section, I think my goal was um to have the vocal be up front and and to do my best to nail this kind of um like dark um retro but really really cool kind of uh vibe that's that yeah i don't know i think like the original was definitely more playful kind of romantic and i wanted it to start to take a um a different turn um uh, wanted to sound like a little more badass i guess Tired of this conversation We think I'm always way to touch a little Kiss a little all night long You wanna hear me say it I know I kept you waiting Just a little, just a little all night long If I was your boyfriend I'd be giving you all my time If I was your boyfriend I'd be giving you all my time if Yeah, so for this section There's a, um, a bunch of elements that kind of pop in after the end of that um this like little vocal phrase here so there's um there's a fill where the these chords pop in and they're kind of foreshadowing um chords that are going to happen during the drop a little bit um just a so, little just a little all night long yeah. oh, was your boyfriend I be giving... so that here's a uh, like this little um synth that pants to the left and then there are these uh, little guitar plucks here that I've got panned to the right. Um, I just thought it was kind of like a nice little thing. I don't think I really do much panning these days, so I thought it'd be fun to try to do some uh, like stuff like that. Um, just a nice little background texture. And then there's um, obviously this pad that pops in here as well. Baseline stays the same. Uh, nothing, nothing there changes. So it's just kind of like elements are building up, adding some tension essentially. And his his um, obviously he's got like this uh, uh, new phrasing here too. Yeah, so that's um that's the the drop, I guess essentially. Um I was um I was trying really hard to figure out whether I wanted vocals um in 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 the drop like i was kind of playing around with uh different writing arrangements and stuff where <clears throat> uh you know i had like a bit of a breakdown slash build where there was just like these piano chords and vocals that then led into a drop um uh, but then i ended up using that as a uh as a build later in the song it turned into this section here I thought that was kind of like a cool reharm on uh, the original uh, vocals, but yeah. So let me break down the the drop here for a sec. It's also not very complex. Um, I think the reason that I ended up choosing uh, this little uh, break slash fake out, um, obviously like a, a bit of a um, a common tool, I guess, in electronic music these days. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the reason that I think it works really well here is because this entire section comes as a bit of a surprise. So it's kind of nice um, to boil things down to just to even less elements instead of having everything full on. And then for the second drop, that's where I have everything uh, popping in right off the bat on the downbeat. But yeah, since you kind of haven't really heard any of the... Uh, the drop um like arrangements and co chords and stuff like that like they're being foreshadowed um a little bit before but uh but yeah so i thought that'd be that's why i th i think at least it, it sounds good to me um uh but yeah so there's this little fake out here right off the bat and then all you hear are like the vocals and some uh, bass sounds and synth chords 
So uh, there's this little fill right before. I can show you guys a little bit of the mastering that I did on this as well. Um, it's, uh, you know, again, not, nothing extremely special, but, uh, but yeah, so essentially right before the downbeat, um, there are these two, three kind of like chord hits, like bum, 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 which are, uh, and then, uh, just a little, um, like rim shot here. And then there's this 808 that, um, rolls down almost like a, like a sliding bass hit to the, um, just kind of leads nicely into the downbeat, I think. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of the bass sounds, it's quite straightforward. Um, you, I, I essentially have two patches here, um, <clears throat> and they're being automated a little bit, of course. But, uh, but yeah, so this guy is the is for sustained notes. Um, so, for example, um, to have uh, a little bit of a like a uh, to have a bass sound accompany, like let's say, like the chords, for example, that happen here. Um, to have a bass sound that accompanies that properly, you know, you want something that's sustained um, and matches the length of the of the chords there. So, um, so that's what that's there for, or for there. It's just um, downbeats and chord accompanying or accompaniment. Um, and then there's this little uh, bass plug here that's just there to fill in the blanks, essentially. So without the bass plugs, this is what it would sound like. So the idea is like essentially the same, but um, it just fills gets filled out a little bit by having those uh, bass plugs in there, which, uh, which yeah, it's nice. Um, the bass plugs aren't really anything particularly special. Um, I've been saying that about pretty much everything in this track, but I mean, I can break them down a little bit. So that's what it sounds like. Um, really, I think... I think a lot of the most interesting characteristics for sounds just obviously just come from post processing and there's no there's no true rules in that regard and I think that's probably for the better. I think it's I always love hearing like textures and and things and sounds and uh, that that I haven't heard before and I think a lot of that comes from post processing but but uh but yeah, so I mean just to I guess give you an example, I'm pretty sure if I take off all the post processing on this bass pluck it's gonna sound totally different so let's do that I'm gonna mute all that what is this layer oh that's some weird stereo thing okay so um so without that stereo layer and without any of the processing let's see what it sounds like uh, it's pretty similar but um definitely definitely think it has a little more flair to it with uh yeah, it's got a nice little, the transient is a little bit sharper, um, and uh, it's got a more grit to it. One of the weird things is with this patch, for some reason, I put a vocoder at like 30% on it with the um, um, with the noise carrier. I don't know why I, I did that. Um, I don't even know if it's really doing that much, but, uh, but yeah, that's part of the chain here. It's a bunch of, it's really a bunch of just compression, saturation, um, a little bit of distortion. Yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. And some EQ. Um, the disperser is really cool. And I, uh, you guys probably know, if you've seen my streams before, like you know that I love this plugin. Uh, but the, this thing is uh, it's pretty sweet. But uh, but yeah, so I guess uh, that's pretty much the gist of the bass sounds. In terms of the chords, those are super straightforward too. So we got... Um, it's yeah i mean this is it i made this patch in like 20 seconds um, it's just a detuned saw it's standard nothing nothing crazy happening here um but uh but yeah just a little bit of mix work to make sure that um it fits into the uh into the track properly and then i added another duplicate of that an octave higher 
um, EQ'd slightly differently as well. Um, just to try to fill out some of the harmonics in the in the high end and stuff. It felt like, uh, here, I'll, I'll show you the comparison with and without. So here's just the um, single octave. And then here's the double octave. So um, it's not you know, a, an incredibly major difference, but in the context of the mix, um, I noticed when I was listening to the track that it was just kind of weird to hear a lot of these like really nice and juicy harmonics in the, in the acapella. And then for some reason, these chord hits weren't really matching that. So I felt like I was kind of compensating for the difference there by adding that, um, additional layer. Uh, yeah. So anyways, um, and other than that, there actually isn't too much sound design. I mean, obviously, there's like some vocal processing and stuff. Um, I mean, his the the vocals on their own sounded um, amazing already, so there wasn't really much I needed to do there. I just pitched him down a, like two semitones, I think. Uh, so this is two two semitones lower than the original, um, and you know, then just like some basic drum sound design. I don't wanna play no games. Hey, thank you for the uh, for the sub, uh, Cerberus. Much appreciated. It is something that I find pretty funny is that there's so many drums in songs of mine where I hear them uh, independently of anything else, and I don't think they sound very very good. Like, I don't think these sound these sound particularly interesting on their own. But I do think that uh, they just sound good in the context of the track. Like I, I definitely mix them in, uh, and uh, like to yeah to fit what's going on here. Uh, cool little detail that's happening here. There's actually um. I've got serum effects here on the master. Um, just got a little flanger action going on during these breaks here. Um, so you can kind of hear it um, popping in briefly here. Or actually, sorry, I think that's maybe that's just on the vocal, um, not on the master. Let me check. Or it might actually be on the chords, but you do hear it popping in right before the drop. So and actually here as well and um uh yeah i, I really like uh, this additional little bass layer here too i thought that sounded really cool um yeah this is just another variation i made of the bass patch that's happening here but um just some really minor differences in terms of like lfo movement and there's a uh, more of a uh, more resonance in the filter movement as well so that kind of brings out that that wow kind of kind of sound and it's uh it's always fun to fuck around with that but uh but yeah so i, I guess that pretty much covers the drop and uh i think from there this section is almost identical to the intro but uh Tired of this conversation. there's we that uh <laughs> It'd be funny if I just ended the song there. <laughs> uh, how do you mix reverb on bass and not mud up the mix? Well, um, is there is what do you mean with the? Uh, well, I, I guess. Um, do you think? I guess your question kind of implies that it's more difficult to not mud up the mix. Um, by having reverb on bass compared to other elements, are are you saying that like, um, you're you've had issues with introducing reverb on on bass and mixing it properly in the past, and it's been harder than doing that with uh with other elements? 
There's a, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Per, I think most of the time, I don't, I definitely don't put reverb on my bass sounds. And most of the time, I don't put reverb on my master either. Um, the only reason I have reverb on my master here is because um, I've got like an occasional automation. Um, let's say like during the build, for example, it's always nice to have like a, a little bit of a dry wet contrast. And so that's why I have some of that in here. But uh, the reason I mention that is because most of the time I don't really actually have any reverb on on my bass sounds. Um, bass is something that I prefer dry, and that's usually true for my drums as well. Um, that's kind of how uh, electronic music is mixed for the most part, I think. Um, so yeah, you won't actually hear uh, much reverb on my my bass sounds for the most part. The only time you hear them is more as like a cr creative embellishment or um as a transitional tool of some kind so uh let's see if i can give an example so like this this thing here for example this was just like a creative embellishment and that's actually not even reverb that's delay but you know um just trying to make a point i guess if you hear the bass sounds on their own there really isn't uh there really isn't reverb on them uh so the way that i approach that stuff is usually um yeah i think most of the time the, the writing style that i have just isn't compatible with reverb on on bass so so long story short i don't really have experience with putting reverb on bass anyways but speech res did give a good example of how you could try to mix it in properly i think um Reverb with having reverb in the low end in general is pretty, pretty tricky. I don't see many people doing that for a good reason. Um, I think it's kind of, kind of hard to pull off, and it also just generally doesn't sound that that great unless you're doing something kind of cinematic. In that case, it can be really freaking cool. But uh, but yeah. So there's not much to talk about here, uh, except for um, the reharm, I guess. So bear with me here. I'm gonna have a ton of delay. Um, I do have reduced latency, but I've got so much stuff on the master. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be impossible to to play this. Let's see. <laughs> so um, the key of the song is essentially. Um, e major of the remix at least uh, I think the original is maybe um, F sharp major or something um, so here here are the chords for uh, this little kind of bridge build thing so it's kind of cool because it's really just transposing the the same chord um, over and over so we got E major, F, or sorry, E major, G major, A major, C major. And um, it's kind of cool that that happens to work with the vocals. So uh, let me see. I think the vocals are doing. This delay is insane. But, uh, but yeah. So it's it's always a fun challenge to try to reharm stuff in a way that is um, new and interesting. But uh, but yeah, anyway. So those are the chords, and then obviously you can kind of create various different um, movements um, between the voicings and and stuff, and do different inversions and add different uh, extensions and all that kind of stuff. And you know, you can if you play it plain, this is what it would sound like. then you can do whatever you want with it obviously I 
That delay is so crazy. I think it's like... I think it's maybe half a second or so. Um, but yeah. And then right before um, the second drop, there's just this tiny little uh, vocoded blip here. Make the self So, um, like I was saying before, the second drop uh, starts right off the bat. So, I think it works because at this point you've already heard what the drop sounds like. So, I think there's no reason to hold hold elements back. So, it's kind of full throttle. Um, there's this little, for example, I guess like another way in which that happens, aside from maybe just having the drums there, uh, you know, if you guys remember the the first drop has that little dropout thing. But you notice that there's no panic note in the background. So the second half of the drop here. So you guys hear that um hear that string sound in the background and that's uh so essentially there's this little staccato layer going on the downbeats and then there's uh this layer as well and uh those kind of panic notes are really great for maintaining tension so uh i think there's enough happening right off the bat for the first drop where you don't need to have it there in the in the first half at least it didn't seem natural to have it there initially so uh so to keep the momentum going for the second half that's where i introduced that panic note but for the second drop um there is essentially no holding back and uh um, like i was mentioning before you know the drums pop in right away there's no fake out um and uh, and on top of that, there is that panic note right off the bat as well. So subtle differences, but I do think that it kind of communicates that um, heightened energy uh, right off the bat. That's, I think that's something that you really have to be super aware of as a producer is um, how, um, you know, how s s things make you feel ultimately. Uh, I know that's maybe a little bit of a generic blanket statement, but uh, but yeah, I think it's really important to be aware of um, how all the different elements are kind of um, uh, collectively creating what you're what you're hoping for so i guess in, a, in, a, in an ideal world you know every element is playing a specific role you know you take something out and it makes a noticeable and like significant difference um you know whether it's like oh this song has just subtly changed or or what the hell just you know this thing is like totally off now you know like you could take out an element like the drums and obviously it would sound super completely different um but you could also you know it something that is kind of like a background element like for example this panic note um you take that out and that also makes a, a difference too it may not be as obvious but it's still a layer that is important so oh wait sorry i didn't meet the strings the strings so so it actually uh, interestingly enough there's there are these brief moments that um you may not even like consciously be aware of where there is like a little bit of silence um unless there is that panic note in there and so uh it just fills in that that empty space completely and there's like no 
no more uh, no more breathing room um which i think yeah i think it's part of the reason why it communicates that that energy there it's just that like um i don't know it's kind of like if you were at a concert and you're hearing hearing uh hearing something uh, a, a band play live or something you know you're gonna hear like so much background background noise and it just fills in that that empty space I think that's kind of what this what this is doing too. Like it didn't necessarily specifically have to be let's say let's say like a a string or like a synth panic note. It could have been, um, I mean, it could have been fully from like a um, an audience in the background or something like that. Just to just some noise essentially to fill in that blank um, and communicate the uh, just the intensity of that. But but yeah, and then the nice thing about that is that for the second half, um, when you do get, when I did get rid of uh, that panic note, it opens things up back, uh, back up a little bit. So um, it's uh, so that's where this brief little kind of like vocal phrase comes in here. So yeah, I think part of the reason that um, that section works as well is because, partially because it's just a fun uh, variation. You know, it's the end of the song. It's like you can kind of get away with some random stuff. So um, I wanted to do some vocal chopping anyways. And then I just kind of heard in my mind, I was thinking of having that line just kind of like, would you ever, would you ever let me know? Just kind of like repeating over and over. Um, so I sketched it out. Um, and then... And then yeah, and then the song just ends with uh, just that last little phrase from the the chorus. Seamith, you finally yo finally caught one of your streams. Hey, welcome. Um, so yeah, I mean that's pretty much the gist of the tune. Um, let me see if there's anything else. I recorded some small little guitar phrases that I thought were going to be a bigger part of the track right here. Here too. So I, I ended up just using them uh, as kind of like a uh, supplemental element. So it kind of plays along with the chords uh, right here. And, uh, and then there's like these, these subtle little acoustic strums happening as well um, in the background. So it's kind of like a nice little texture. It almost sounds like the synths are like being strummed. So like, I thought it was kind of nice. A nice little touch. And the last thing I'll talk about for the remix is, um, I guess, just the chain that I have going here on my master. I think I could have done this a lot better for sure, but there are just a few key things to note, I think, for, for any of you that might have interest in this. You know, some of you might be, um, you know, more experienced than I actually. So in that case, you may not have, may not want to listen to any of this, but, um, but yeah, I guess when it comes to mastering, obviously I always start with a limiter and <clears throat> I think it's pretty important to, I think part of the reason why it's nice to do like mastering and mixing that kind of stuff yourself, like even if you may not be able to compete with, let's say like a top tier engineer in the industry, I do consider mixing and mastering still to be like part of the creative process to a degree. Um, just because uh, it is ultimately shaping the sound of uh, your music and um, you know, you, you're, that's how you communicate your ideas is literally through the sounds that you're sharing with people. So I think just because it might be like smaller details, um, they can add up and make a big difference. Um, so I, I think like uh, I consider them still part of the creative process. Um, so I generally do it myself and, you know, I'll get to a point with a song where I'll throw on the limiter and then I'll start messing around with, uh, you, well, for electronic music at least, I'll, just, I'll start messing around with the various like gain settings in Pro L. 
Um, and, you know, some of their presets are really fun to mess around with as well. So I, I start off by doing that. And then um, getting things to, uh, like, desired loudness level can actually be pretty important. Um, just because nowadays it's actually very valuable to have your song be at similar um, volume levels as other music out there because it makes the listening experience a lot better. So, you know, obviously imagine you're listening to a playlist on Spotify and a song comes up while you're, you know, let's say like driving to work or, you know, you're working out or whatever. So you got your playlist going, a song comes up and it's, you know, like several decibels um, quieter than everything else in the playlist. Like, well, it's not really going to make a great listening experience because then you have to turn that back up. So obviously most music nowadays is kind of mastered um, in, in, a, in a way that's, yeah, just kind of like compatible for the for most people's listening experience um but uh but yeah obviously it varies depending on the genre and all that kind of stuff too it's not like you know edm is mastered <laughs> insanely loud uh versus you know pop might obviously be a little bit more tame than that you know it might have more dynamics but it's not going to be a complete complete brick wall so this is a uh, i think this is kind of like a happy medium like it's pretty loud um, it could have been way louder for sure, but that wasn't really, I think the point of this, the point of this is just to be like, I think like a dance friendly, um, like electronic rendition of this pop track. So with that in mind, you know, obviously I wanted to kind of push the, uh, the volume a bit, but not to the extent that maybe some other electronic music would, um, uh, luckily Spotify and stuff has level matching. That's very true. I don't even, uh, I kind of forgot about that, but that is true. Um, They've got some other pretty cool stuff going um, with their uh, with their playlist as well with the uh, the transitions that are going on there between the songs, but uh, but yeah, anyways, so that's a pretty um, generic way to start is obviously with the the limiter, um, and then from there, obviously limiting is essentially just um, a very high degree of compression, um, and so compression obviously important and other. Um, like specific frequency ranges. So uh, I just got this Pro M to kind of uh, tame specific areas a little bit. Nothing crazy, um, Pro M B that is. And that's on the master as well. So keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, I don't really know to what degree that's correct, but it did sound better to me with the Pro M B on there. Um, some really subtle EQing here too uh, on the master. I just wanted to scoop out the stereo on the low end. Um, and I just did like some really s subtle, um, uh, stuff here. Nothing crazy. I think one of the cool things though, is this plugin here that m some of you guys, some of you guys may have heard me uh, talk about before. Um, and so this plugin is kind of like a, um, it's a great mastering plugin. I, I use it usually at the end, um, of, a uh, of a a any kind of like, uh, production process I'll slap this on there and see if it makes a difference because uh, a, a lot of times I'll be so kind of caught up with you know initially like let's say like ideation process it's like okay well you, what am I even going to do right so you're not really worried about like super specific things like um, how much stereo signal is there in the song like is there um, you know is the low end loud enough and that kind of stuff like at first you're like well what am I what am I even what am I even working with here right so as you start building that further and further and you've got like your foundations are taken care of and it's like, okay, okay, this is what the song is here. The, here's how these things should sound. And then you get them closer and closer. And then eventually, uh, once you're, you know, t at the end uh, towards the finish line, slap this thing on there. And, um, what I like about it is that, uh, it's not just a multiband compressor. It actually allows you to compress mid and side signals separately. So the way it's got it split up here is, um, it has like the sidechain functionality too, but I don't use that. So it's got this, uh, uh, these three um, categories here. So it's got mid low, mid high. So it splits up your mids into two categories. Um, and you can decide where that crossover frequency is for those two. And then just some really basic, uh, yeah, generic compression settings here. And then for this, the, the side, um, it's just got one. So check this out. If I solo um, the side signal, it actually feeds it back in mono 
which is super, super helpful because it allows you to more accurately compare the la perceived loudness of stereo signals versus mono signals. So you can like solo that. And then you can switch over to the mid high and solo them both and just go back and forth and be like, okay, what does this sound like? Uh, how loud does that sound? And then. So um, my approach is more or less that um, there there are a lot, most elements I try to have um, stereo information on. I think with drums, it's not always essential, at least with kick drums, not really super important. It can be can be cool, though. Um, but uh, but yeah, other than that, I, I try to make sure that I'm paying attention to the uh, loudness levels of different elements in the stereo um, signal. So what that means is that, you know, when I was originally like trying to master the song, I was listening to this and I realized um, a few things. Like, first of all, I was listening to this. Uh, when I pressed solo, uh, I, I couldn't hear, let's say like my bass. I couldn't hear my chords very well either. And so um, that's something that I always do towards the end of finalizing a piece is I'll start playing around a lot with mid and stereo signals to try to kind of optimize those. And I think that, you know, whether that's, again, whether that's correct or not, kind of up to you to decide, I think. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to pretend like I've got like, I do have a lot of experience under my belt, but I, I just kind of do what I think sounds good. So, um, so yeah, just take take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But regardless of whether uh, you have like the same ethos with, let's say, like cutting and mixing mid-size stuff, this is still a cool way to uh, to reference it. You know, obviously, like on the master, you could take like utilities if you're using Ableton. You could take utilities and just uh, make the whole thing. Uh, mono make the whole thing stereo but the fact that this actually spits it back in um, sp spits the stereo back in mono is surprisingly helpful to be able to uh, mix properly so yeah and then you can kind of um, you can you can use that um, to mix the, the the side better and then you can actually like compress it as well so I like having, um, I like the idea of the stereo presence of most elements pretty much being like equivalent to what their mono presence is. Um, it's so like for my chords, like it depends on the element for sure. It's like vocals, I guess, are usually more, more mono um, for sure. Uh, and it depends on the section of the song and, and stylistically what you're going for and stuff. And like drums are always more mono than stereo too for me. Um, again, depends a little bit like claps, that kind of stuff sometimes will be way more stereo. Like some fills will, um, will be more stereo and stuff, but usually m more mono other elements, you know, like chords, like these things, uh, these chords are pretty, pretty active in the stereo space. Um, um, but th I think they're also pretty damn active in mono as well. Uh, but just not as much, I think. So we can actually use BXXL to reference that quickly. Let's check it out. So in, in uh, just the sides for, B, for this synth, and then the mids for this synth. You know, actually, it, I guess it sounds like the mids might actually still be louder for it, but uh, but yeah. And then another help, helpful thing for BXXL too is this uh, these meters up here. Uh, it's got this correlation meter, which more or less tells you like how in phase your mix is, which is cool. Um, I'm not going to lie. I don't think I actually paid attention to that when I was working on this. Um, let's see what it says about my. So I think the closer to plus one it is, that means the more in phase it is. Um, I believe. I, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um which makes sense because most elements are pretty pretty mono heavy um it's, it's just like drums vocals and um and bass and the bass mostly is is uh mono as well but 
but yeah, I kind of prefer to, like I said before, I prefer to hear a lot of elements in stereo as well if they're in mono. Um, just not usually below like 150 hertz or so. That's kind of where I start um, 100 hertz or something. That's where I start cutting out the stereo for the low end. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so for this sound, for example, I remember when I was just isolating the stereo, um, this, this bass sound here. So that originally was completely mono too. And I didn't even realize because, uh, you know, I was just producing and writing the track. Um, so it was a pretty easy fix. Just ended up introducing a little bit of, um, uh, unison action. And then um, I kind of like found a certain level um, in uh, like the stereo signal that I thought sounded good. And um, that's why this EQ here is separate is because, like I said before, eventually I, I go through the different elements and I try to like match the or just um, mix the mid sides a little bit to, to find what I want. I think, I, again, I think I could have done a better job, but it was just a it was a quick turnaround. Um, so let me see if there's anything else in this chain that's interesting. Um, I mean, there, there are some effects that kind of pop in briefly. Um, so like, you know, there's a little filter action here. Um, and I do specifically turn off the filters for a reason. Um, the auto filters, if there's a low pass or high pass in the master, I would definitely recommend being careful with that because, um, it's, uh, uh, it will still cut out some frequencies um, and you may you may or may not want that so I think it's good to be careful about that and to just like turn off filters on, on the master when you're not using them um, I was contemplating having a transient master on the mix uh, on the master didn't actually didn't actually sound good so I don't I didn't end up rolling with that I was kind of imagining a really subtle um, increase to the sharpness of some of the transients, but it's kind of hard to just throw that on the master and expect it to work because it ends up doing a bunch of random stuff to to other sounds and it's kind of hard to tame. Um, so yeah, and then <clears throat> I have a few other tools here too that I was using just for reference, <clears throat> excuse me, for referencing. Like I've got this, this high pass filter here, um, you know, nothing crazy, but low pass filter here. Um, and this, this was actually an effort to um, imitate what this might sound like on a bad phone. And I think this is like an important aspect of, of mixing and mastering too. to, you know, very, very context and genre dependent and all that. But, um, there's this preset in Pro-Q3 called phone and it's, so it just cut, cuts out all the mids and the highs and creates these kind of like, I think they're just arbitrary peaks in, in the, in the higher mids and uh, just to imitate what um, something might sound like on a phone. And I think this is something that's really good to keep in mind um, for the most part, like is, is uh, your mix translation to, to other platforms and stuff. So, you know, you, you want to, obviously people are going to consume music on all sorts of different uh, devices, phones, laptops, tablets, uh, you know, they're, they're going to hear it live too. And it's going to sound amazing if you mix it all, uh, well, uh, live, but you want it to obviously sound good on other, uh, devices too. And in other settings. So what that usually means is you want to put your mix. Um, I start with trying to control the mix, um, in an ideal environment. And then you want to throw your mix in bad environments. You want to hear how it holds up. Um, if you do cut out some of those um, really nice uh, like frequencies, you know, without the low end, without the high end, <clears throat> what does your song sound like? And it's really weird. I mean, you, nowadays it's kind of hard to tell, hard to know at all how people are, uh, how you can try to replicate this. I mean, I, I upload my music onto SoundCloud privately all the time and I try to listen to it on my phone and my laptop and stuff to try to get a feel for it. Um, and you know, you can kind of imitate that by just doing something like this and throwing it on the master and getting a feel for it. And, uh, because your music will sound super, super different, um, uh, when it's listened to in this way. So the idea is that you try to adapt, 
uh, things to to whatever degree you want so that it uh, translates to those uh, those devices too. Doesn't I don't think there's like a super exact science to this. Um, there might be, not, not that I know of at least. Um, it would be interesting to know if there are like EQ curve settings out there for different specific devices, you know, like MacBook Pros and and different iPhones and stuff. And it's kind of wild too, because I remember listening back to this remix on my phone and I turned the volume up all the way. I was going to listen to it while I was showering. And I noticed that past like 90% volume, it started compressing the song. Um, so I don't really know when they introduced that with iPhones, but um, I never really noticed that before up until recently that when you turn up the volume, I think it's past like 90% or something around there. It actually compresses the signal quite a bit. So it, there's even more stuff at play than, than just, you know, EQ curves and that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, so obviously, you know, if I turn this on, uh, it's gonna, well, well, yeah, let me turn it down a little bit. It's going to sound bad, but So it's just a good test to try to figure out, okay, what elements can you still hear well? Um, what elements do you think you might want to hear more of? Uh, what elements do you want to hear less of? Um, yeah, just generic questions like that um, should be answered with uh, EQ curves that imitate um, devices with, with poor um, playback quality. Or, you know, relatively poor, I guess I should say. So, uh, so yeah, anyways, I guess that pretty much sums up um, the, 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 the mastering uh, side of things. And, I mean, I don't know if there's that much to talk about in terms of mixing. It's, it's really not, like I said before, it's not, not a super complex tune. There's not a crazy amount of stuff happening. And it's quite short as well, actually. Um, but, uh, but, yeah. I love the way you harmonize the vocals and the chorus with those tensions and the Phrygian vibe. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's what I started the remix off with um, was uh, was those chords. Uh, one thing I did see how my mix would sound on an iPhone without using one is I captured an impulse response of the speakers. Um, yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a good idea as well. Um, that's cool how you can effectively simulate a device with poor, back, uh, poor playback using that little plug-in dialogue needs stuff. Lots of TIL content. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I don't think any of this is... Um, I don't mean to sound like I, I have a ton of experience with this stuff, but I do want to just kind of share the process that I found is, uh, is interesting. Um, and I think it's, I think it's pretty useful, but, uh, but yeah, I didn't really have much else planned for today's stream, to be honest. Um, that is, uh, the, that's the state of the remix. Um, and it's coming out tomorrow, which is pretty exciting. I literally finished it, um, on Friday. And it's coming out tomorrow. <laughs> That's so crazy to me. I've never released a song within less of a week of uh, finishing it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. And in case any of you guys are curious, I am still working on switching towards Reaper. That was not a, uh, a random week-long phase. So yeah, I think the original, um, I think the original just had those, I think, so, um,
See, I, th I think that's one of the fun things about reharming is you always try to follow. Some pennies for your MP3 free trip. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aman. I appreciate it. Yeah, I need to. I really need to get that thing back into action. Um, but yeah, I could briefly talk about the reharming as well. Why are you switching DAW? I am obsessed with the idea of um, having complete control over actions. Um, so actions are are uh, what, at least in, in Reaper, uh, actions are just um, scripts that can uh, execute certain um, demands inside of the DAW. So, you know, obviously, like, if you're using Ableton, you press Control T, T it opens up a track. So that's um, like a shortcut, right? Um, but, you know, Ableton is running a script that um, that works within the DAW that allows you to do that. And, you know, it doesn't have to be Control T. You can, I think you can change all those. Uh, I think you can change those in Ableton, can't you? Actually, maybe you can't even do that. I don't think you can. But um, it doesn't actually really matter that much. The, the main point I'm making is not so much about like those short shortcuts, like having different shortcuts and Reaper being able to program your own is, is a big, big deal. Um, because you can isolate like super specific things in your workflow and say like, okay, you know what? I do this all the time where I love loading this specific set of instruments with these EQ settings, um, routed in this way with sidechain on them. And it's like, yeah, you can have all of that happening with one click. And um, I think that's really freaking cool. There are some people that created something similar in Ableton called a live enhancement suite, and that's pretty sweet. Uh, no pun intended. That was definitely <laughs> an accident. Um, but yeah, that that's pretty cool. But it's really just scratching the surface. And unfortunately, it gives you, it's still very limited uh, flexibility with um, loading specific uh, like plugins at um, within like, by just clicking on a track. I think what they, they made it so that, you know, you can right click on a track and you can load um, effects and instruments and stuff like that immediately from, from there. It's like an additional little window. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it might seem like a subtle difference, but I spend so much time in my DAWs that um, to make music that I think things like that will go a long way in the long run. So I, I just love the idea of being able to, program little workflow efficiency like efficiencies like that and it it goes beyond just preference to a degree too because it's like you want to work as fast as, as possible um most of the time be, that's just that's just uh, you or sorry not as fast i, I think like you want to work efficiently really is what you want to do and working efficiently means that um uh you translate what you're hearing um, like your idea and you execute it um, before <laughs> you know you lose sight or interest those are two very important things when working on something you don't want to lose sight or interest of of what it is that you're doing because um, that happens all the time like let's say if you're you know if I hadn't used Ableton before and I'm like oh I've got an idea for a song that could be really really cool it's like great well it's gonna I'm gonna have to look up the manual and how to do a billion different things and instead of like writing, I'm going to be like learning, right? Uh, how to use a DAW. And that's obviously the learning curve of learning any software. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the idea is, you know, you get more familiar with DAWs and then, okay, you don't have to think about stuff. It's muscle memory. So, okay, you know, oh, you want to load another instance of Serum. So, okay, you know, for me, that's what I would do is I do control shift T and say, okay, uh, plugins, you know, look in here and then I find a uh, serum and then I throw it in there and that's, that's great and all, you know, it's not actually that hard or, or it's not a slow workflow at all to be doing stuff in, in Ableton or, or other DAWs, but, um, the level of incre increased, uh, the potential of Reaper is just that like, yeah, it's just so customizable. And I think that, um, if you can work more efficiently, it's worth taking on that risk of being uh slow and uh, initially um because the payoff down the road is is massive massive but 
but yeah, I do I do think it'd be kind of fun to maybe talk about the reharm briefly. Um, why is your Ables Ableton skin so dark? I prefer it darker. Um, it just uh, it looks a lot better to me this way. It's more pleasing to my eyes. And, you know, I stare at this freaking screen for hours and hours a day, so um, I don't like the the bright ones quite as much. Is it custom? Nope. Um, it is not. I forget where I got it from, but I can tell you that it's called Flat Clean Neon Wave Cyberpunk. <laughs> I mean, okay, so this is what this skin looks like. What's the standard? Oh, Jesus, what is this? Dark. That doesn't look too bad either. Um, but, uh, but yeah, anyways. I'm going to talk briefly about the uh, the reharm if you guys have any interest in that. And then I'm going to probably call it quits in the stream for today. And get back to work and Reaper. I don't think that's going to be particularly interesting to anyone. Um, seeing as I'm going to be mostly fumbling around learning shortcuts. And probably trying to learn a little bit more about programming. Um, Um, but yeah, the reharming of the, the vocal was actually a bit of a challenge because, um, essentially the song, the, the, uh, song girlfriend, um, uh, was written in Mixolydian. Uh, so that's the, uh, um, a scale that starts in the fifth scale degree of Ionian, which is major, um, the major scale. So... Uh, so obviously this is C major and then, um, Mixolydian would sound like this. So subtle difference, but it's got that. Versus if it was major, it would sound like this. totally different vibe um so it's actually quite unusual because most of the time people are singing for pop music at least they're singing like pentatonic stuff so they're going like they're doing that kind of stuff or maybe it'll be in major instead or something like that and keeping in mind of course pentatonic is just any five note scale But, uh, but yeah, so I guess what I found tricky was like, well, Mixolydian is a pretty specific sound. So I wasn't really sure where to go with it um, initially outside of the chords you had already written for it. Uh, so I can pull up the acapella again. Let's see, collaborations, uh, remixes. Uh, remixes. Charlie Puth. Charlie. Charlie Bettany. Okay, yeah, here we go. So let me just uh, unwarp it. Yeah. Tired of this conversation. We didn't come all this way to touch a little, kiss a little. So normally, um, part of my thought process with uh, remixing stuff is just uh, experimenting with new new keys. Um, but that's really, really hard to do with the Mixolydian, it turns out. So, you know, I, I usually try to, you know, if it's a major, I'd try to go for the par parallel minor, for example. Um, but that kind of doesn't really work in Mixolydian. So, you know... Let's say that the key of this is A flat um, Mixolydian. Then you know the the if it was major, the parallel major minor. The sorry, if it was major, the parallel minor would be F minor. So check it out. What it sounds like if I play F minor, though, it doesn't sound good. Yeah. 
Tired of this conversation. We didn't come all this way to touch a little. Right? So, um. So I quickly realized I kind of had to stay in the major, um, more or less. Uh, so the only flexibility I had was trying to um, uh, just get creative within the, the major scale, I guess, the mixolydian stuff. Um, so that's where I started experimenting with those uh, with those chords. Yeah. Tired of this conversation. We didn't come all this way to touch a little, kiss a little. So, um, with the notes you were seeing there, I was able to kind of sneak in the major sevenths. Um, but, um, But yeah, anyways, I mean, it's always a good reharming exercise to do something you haven't uh, done before. So this this was a super fun acapella to, uh, or just track in general. I mean, I I really only used the vocals for the remix. There's some some little guitar plugs from the original as well that I used. But uh, but yeah, so that's kind of like how I ended up trying to write some chords for it. Yeah. Tired of this conversation. We didn't come all this way to touch a little, kiss a little all night long. You wanna hear me say it? I know I kept you waiting just a little, just a little all night long. Can't stop till you're lying right here next to me. I should stop. This is more than just a face Baby, would you ever want to be my girlfriend? If you want it, let me know We can make this selfish show Don't we look perfect, baby? Let's take this further, baby Just a little, just a little All night long If I was your boyfriend, I I'd be giving you all my time Now just a little, just a little But yeah, anyways, um, so I don't think it was the easiest uh, acapella to, to reharm, but, uh, but yeah, it was a good exercise regardless and a super fun one at that. Anyways, guys, um, I believe that will be it for today.
If you have any other questions about the remix, feel free to let me know. I think I went over it in, in maybe too much detail even. Love the piano noodling. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, the intention for today's stream was just to kind of like reconnect um, and show you guys, show you guys the full, the full remix that I did of this track. Uh, and yeah, it's gonna be out tomorrow. Hope you guys, uh, hope you guys enjoy it. And I shall be back Friday for another feedback, a feedback Friday. If you guys want to tune in, if you guys, if you got some. Uh, Got some tracks you want to share with me uh, that you're working on or that you like or you want to hear me jam on. Um, that's what I do on Fridays. Um, and yeah, it's going to be at 6, 6 p.m. CDT. But yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for the subs. Um, and I shall see you guys next time. Peace.